Okay, tonight is the advisory team member advisory team meeting on September 14th, 2022. We're starting a little bit late at 6.08 p.m. We are in the Community Development Building, and Jeff Larson from the Sheldon Theater is our first guest. We have a small but powerful group tonight, and we will now say our names. Steve Blaine. Nice to meet you. <laughs> Jeff Larson. Michelle Lisey. Sarah Kern. Alexis DeVries. All right. So, Jeff, do you want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Just a little bit about you, maybe. Sure. Fun stuff, good stuff, whatever, background, whatever you want. And then you can tell us all about the Sheldon. Yeah. And then we can kind of ask questions and ideas. And Michael did ask one idea that I'm going to pass along. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, I run. I'm the, I, I think official title is Executive and Artistic Director of the Sheldon, which, you know, I don't usually use the full thing because that's some kind of stuff. Uh, but um, I started at the Sheldon in, at the end of February 2020, uh, so just in time to shut the place down. Uh, my business partner and I were, uh, we had a shot of oh, Russell, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, um, <clears throat> had a, a small arts consulting firm and we were brought in to help replace my predecessor. Uh, I was going to run the Sheldon temporarily and uh, we were going to help to do a search for the for her replacement and it just, uh, then COVID happened. So the first thing I did was shut the place down and ran the Sheldon through COVID. And I think we just all got used to each other. Um, I ended up just taking on the job permanently as of about a year ago. And um, yeah, before that, uh, my background is in, uh, I, went to, I went to the U uh, for business and got sick of that, didn't like it. Uh, switched to theater halfway through because I had a theater job and quite like that. Uh, so worked in production and directing uh, in the cities for a while and got pulled into administration. I had a boss who found out that I had a business degree. He said, I gotta make a job for you. <laughs> so that, I got pulled in. So um, I've worked in theaters all over the cities. Uh, I ran the Minnesota Fringe Festival for a while. Uh, the Fringe is a, uh, a wild event. It's smaller now than it used to be, but um, it's uh, completely lottery selected. So anybody could apply, uh, apply to do a show at the Fringe. You get an hour, we get you a stage, we get you technicians. And, you know, really was free for all. And I, you will see me bringing some of that to the, to the show. Like, I really believe in this community engagement and having Red Wing residents on the stage. Um, we just announced an event coming up with uh, Mary Jo Pale uh, from Mystery Science Theater 3000. Uh, she is going to be doing a storytelling show at the, at the Sheldon, but we're also having her come in to teach storytelling a couple days beforehand. So if you have a story, you can come in, get some coaching from Mary Jo, and then open for her. Uh, so that's, you know, and, and I love that. I think that's what the Sheldon is for. We can do huge, you know, exciting um, performances, you know, national touring acts, but also I want to see you guys out there. Um, I don't think, like, I assume I don't have to talk about, like, you live here. You know the shelter better than I do. Like, you know, basically, you know, unless... Maybe we should say a little bit. We should... <clears throat> I would do this if it were a bigger group or a smaller group, but we should... I think it'd be good to go around and just say, like, have you been in the Sheldon? Have you gone to shows in the Sheldon? Because we probably all have a different experience of the Sheldon. Yeah. So, Sarah, what do you... What's your experience with the Sheldon? Nothing, because I moved to right before COVID hit. Ah, all right. So... My experience is nothing, but I've heard nothing but wonderful things. Okay. So, have you been? You don't have to buy a no. <laughs> no, no, but really, I have. And no, I haven't been inside. The um, so I work at Hope Coalition, and we the Sheldon has donated tickets so that our clients and people who are living in our shelter can go to shows. So that has been really nice. Um, and we've been able to send families to other play, like to certain plays and things like that. Um, and I know that Santa goes there during the holiday stroll, and that's kind of my experience with the Sheldon. Mm -hmm. Nope. I got my picture on Santa's lap last year. It was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> what about you, Lexi? Um, I haven't been there since I was in school. Because I did go to school here and everything, and I know that. We went there once. I don't even remember what we saw, because it was a long time ago. <laughs> but um, um, I know that one of my friends is really in the theater type thing and everything, so he's been there a lot, and um, I, I hear good things, but I haven't been 
in there. But I do have two kids, and my son is getting to the point where he can actually sit maybe through a show. So, like, yeah. I think that because I, I asked him if he, we were down at the library, and I had asked him if he wanted to go there soon, and he said yes. So, you got some. Might be visiting. <laughs> I have someone on staff with young kids, and she has been pushing me to get more family shows, especially yes. for people with younger kids. So, definitely check it out. Like, okay. And, yeah. you know, now you're going to know how to reach me, so if you ever mm -hmm. want to, you know, hook up on tickets, I can For sure, for know. sure, yeah. That's, that's what, what you get for coming in. <laughs> yeah, I saw, like, a, I was going to look and see if there was any, like, family type of shows or mm -hmm. anything like that. So, I mean, that's really good to hear because my son, he was loving. So. Did you say, too, before, because I might forget, but did you say that you could walk in and, like, if she had her son... Yeah, if you you're could walk through and see it. Hi, Corey. Oh, Good. There's pizza. Come and sit down. <laughs> if you're at the library, Welcome. like if you're in the neighborhood, if the box office is open, the space is open. So you too, if you haven't been in there, like come on over. We have a self-guided tour brochure. You can you just wander around. Um, so yeah, any really? like, afternoon after one, just I you know. Did not know that. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty stunning in there. It, it's oh. you know. It's always fun to see people walk in for the first time and think, what the, this isn't Red Wing? <laughs> so, it is, yeah. I remember that. Yeah. I remember it being huge when I went in there and I was like, this doesn't look that big from the outside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that after one o'clock that you mentioned, after Jeff? One. Okay. Yeah, I, I should know the box office hours better than I do. No, that's okay. I just <laughs> wanted, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we were going around, Corey, we were just, we kind of introduced and then Jeff was talking, but now we're telling what our experience is with the Sheldon to kind of get a read on how much everybody knows about it or not. So Steve, what's your experience with the Sheldon? Um, same thing, moved here right at COVID time, <clears throat> but uh, uh, my youngest son and his wife uh, have been in town for five years and they've been there several times. And, cool. You know, talk about it all the time. They, mm -hmm. And my oldest son lives in Minneapolis. He hasn't been here yet, but he's both of them have been, you know, to Minneapolis to a bunch of the, the Guthrie, and, and mm -hmm. in fact, they just saw Wicked was in town. Oh, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. and my oldest son had went there. In fact, they sat next to the the mayor of Minneapolis. So they stopped that. But uh, I said, oh, we got to go to that. And I looked, and it was like the night before the last show. Uh, but uh, we talked, in fact, the... <clears throat> I forget what the official title is, but the welcome wagon for um, Red Wing and the coupons they give you is tickets to the uh, free show at Sheldon. Oh, right. So uh, we still have that in my desk up in the coming hall sitting right there. So. Okay. so it's worth it, I guess, Jeff, yeah. that people are thinking well, about yeah, that. You know, that's good, that. yeah. yeah. Corey, what's your, you spoke well. Yeah. Yeah, she went out here to take um, that. So, um, I mean, I grew up, you know, going to movies there. As a kid, um, that's when it's still the, the main movie theater in town. Um, the odd. The odd. I had my first date there. <laughs> I think it went to Slack. Maybe. Okay, I think. Um, and, uh, or no, maybe Tootsie. I think it went to I don't know. One of the two. Um, and uh, had been involved in, well, well used to be Red Wing Summer Playhouse. So I did my first show there, I don't know, long to Christmas Carol. Oh, long okay, long. wow. Um, and then uh, I've done, you know, over the years done different shows um, with Phoenix Theater and Red Wing Summer Playhouse, so. Um, what was the last one that you were in, Corey? That was the, uh, was that was the Metamorph? Oh, yeah, okay, okay, yeah. And then, Norwegians, I think. Okay. Okay. I can't remember. You've done a lot. Yeah. Um, yes, it's been a, you know, my family's been involved with it for a long time, too. I've been there for the rededication. Mm -hmm. so. Good. I just thought it'd be good to, because we all have different, you know, experiences yeah. with it, so. All right. Well, you can see that <clears throat> we've got a ton of shows in. Uh, this is the first season that's, uh, starting next week. This is the first season I've programmed all myself. Uh, last year was about half me, half body, my predecessor. Uh, so you'll kind of see what I'm doing here. Um, and a lot of, the way I think of a Sheldon as I want it to be the most red wing thing. I think there's a way to, uh, to 
you program a uh, space like the shell that we're using, like, I'm going to put Red Wing on the map. Like, I want to impress my New York friends with, like, the kinds of shows I can bring to the shell. And that's just not, I, I'm not interested in that for here. I really want this to be kind of Red Wing's living room and to be something that, where it is for everyone in town. And I think we have a lot of work to do there in everyone in Red Wing being able to say, this is a place where people like me go. And I think we have a responsibility there that this is a, this is one of two that I know of city-owned theaters in the country. And I think that being owned by the city means that you can't be for just the elites or you know just for certain people in town. So that's the work I'm doing, is just trying to reach out as broadly as I can and say, what do you want to see here? Um, I started a program, I will call it a program, this is just a goofy idea I had, but um, I'm going to every, every group I can think of in Red Wing and asking, like, you know, saying, I have a stage, I've got money, what do you want to see here? Uh, so last year we uh, went to Hispanic Outreach and they had a name and they uh, was Florida to La a New York based um, uh, female mariachi group. And okay, I'll go get them. And we did that and it was, it was super fun. It was the kind of thing that I would not have thought of on my own. So I'm really trying to root this space in Red Wing and make it a good citizen and not stuffy. So I think like that's a, like for those of you who've been in there, and I came in, I started shaping right away at, you know, like her dad's on the board, so I'm gonna like talk oh, about the board. And, like, but like, you know, the, you can. it's always- You can, you yeah, I mean, it's described as the jewel of Red Wing. It's like, no, I don't, no, that's, the jewels aren't for everybody. And this is, this, this is for everybody. I want, you know, this is Red Wing's living room. Um, so I'm really pushing for more fun, more, I don't think we've got anything this season that you, you can't wear jeans to. You know, this is, this is a casual place. Uh, we used to have a popcorn machine. This was a movie theater. This, this shouldn't be intimidating for, for anybody. So that's the, you know, everybody who works for me is bored of hearing me say that, but it's really the thing that I want for this theater is just, you know, really easy to come in. Um, part of what we've done this year as well is we've made it a lot cheaper to come to shows. Um, it used to have two price levels, like high and higher. And I, <laughs> I spread it out to, to three or four levels so that I think you can come to every show this season for 20 bucks or less. Um, and the show is not big. So those aren't bad seats. Not, you know, you're not you're not so far away. Uh, so that's a thing that's new this year, and and you know you'll look at this and be like, well, this guy's talking a big game about like broadening the shell, and we're not quite there yet. And you know, it's first try. Mm -hmm. So um, I can ramble longer, but I don't know if you have questions or like what what do you want to know? Um, is this all for this year? Yeah, this in the back, so I didn't know if I was getting into like. A nope. Year. Yeah, okay. see, the 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 real like the, this page is the whole season, and this is all September. Oh yeah, okay. Out. So yeah, we open next week, and uh, yeah, so it's a lot. We almost every weekend is a new show. I think there's thirty-seven shows this year. So, so is the show been always more about bringing shows in rather than local groups putting something on? Because like there's a little shop of. Was that, that, was, that was Phoenix, that was local. Yeah, so we, we have local groups. Uh, some of them are, are rentals, like the Sheldon Theater Brass Band is actually not affiliated with the Sheldon Theater in any way, uh, aside from being a tenant. Um, there's Phoenix Theater. There used to be more uh, local groups uh, who played. I think they got priced out. Um, the Sheldon was you know not in the best financial shape for a while, uh, so they raised the rental rates. Uh, I'm working, I'm trying to get some of them back. And um, ideally, you know, I think nobody wants to play to a half empty house or less. So, I'm, you know, and it's expensive there. So I'm trying to get local groups to combine in a double bill. So, um, you know, you do the men singers and the brass band, for instance, like have a double show. So you, you're each bringing your own audience, it, it, you know, and that cost gets spread out and the audience is bigger. But it's, it takes some convincing people uh, People get their ideas of what the shelter is for and not for, and you know, then it takes me a while to like, no, really, come back here. It's easy. Are there things that you guys would like to see there 
maybe it's there, maybe it's not, but just when you think about what your family is or what you would want there or anything. I mean, yeah, send me your wish list. Yeah, we can get into details. Um, there was one, as I have two thoughts from people who couldn't be here. One was Liz. She had to be out of town, and so she wanted um, to ask about rush tickets. She had that idea, I think, a long time ago and wanted to bring it up again. Um, the idea of, you know, if you do have, like, <coughs> seats open, can you, or whatever that means. She didn't really um, extrapolate, but I think that would mean, you know, sure. you don't have a lot, and so maybe an hour before you open up, you know, lower price tickets for rush tickets and you put that out and see if people come. Um, Let me do we'll that do that one, one first. first. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So rush tickets, we tried it last year uh, because I was really jumped in and wanted that cheaper way to, for people to come in. It's really hard to communicate and it forces people, because the Sheldon has such a tiny lobby, it forces people to wait outside. So it's, it's not something you want to do in the winter uh, to say like, okay, you're, we're going to release these rush tickets in 20 minutes and you're standing out here until it happens. That's why I added the lower price level to every show this year. Like, you can just get rush tickets in advance now, basically. Uh, so this, this feels easier to us. And it's not so much of an issue now, but during COVID as well, because the Sheldon's lobby is so small, you don't necessarily want people crowding in the lobby. This is another reason for us to not want lines. Um, so yeah, this, I'm trying to get at the, the purpose of rush tickets without doing that exact idea. Great. And then um, Michael's question was um, the idea of a town hall. Um, you know, there weren't a lot of specifics right now, but um, just to have a town hall, a place for people to talk. Um, I think he was thinking, you know, whether it's through the Human Rights Commission or another group of some kind, that this would be sort of a, a place for people to come and talk and do that kind of stuff. Um, it sounds like it, you know, you can do that periodically. I, I don't know. I don't know. If you don't have something on the schedule, then would they just work with you to pay a certain amount? Or how, how would that work if a community group, and maybe it's different if it's a city board or commission because this is a city organization, maybe that's different. So I guess just the idea of town halls, uh, that kind of a thing. I wish yeah. he was here too, again, to have more detail, but... No, it's totally something we can do. It's, uh, we don't have a lot of open nights, but I like the idea of it. During, during COVID, when we couldn't do anything on stage, we did use the space for uh, blood drives uh, because it was a big open room with, uh, you know, with good airflow. Uh, so I'm always looking for ways to make the Sheldon a better citizen. And I, I like that sort of thing. One of the, the sneakier ways than that, I'm getting at the same thing, is I'm looking for shows that bring two different like very disparate audiences together in the same room. Just because I'm very idealistic about like just reminding people like, yeah, we're all humans here. Like we all can like the same thing. So there's a, a group I booked last year called Gangsta Grass, which is a, a bluegrass slash rap uh, group. They're fantastic. And, you know, and that's, you know, it, it's, you know, you got peanut butter and my chocolate kind of thing. Like, it, you know, we have, you know, so, and even uh, we had Nervi, a uh, local Minneapolis rapper, in last year. And that was like, you wouldn't believe, it was such a weird crowd for that show. Like, because it was like, you see like six year old white dudes just up there dancing on the stage, you know, with like Nervi's like more normal audience. And it was like, wow, this is really working. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, it's not quite the same thing as a town hall, but I've been looking at, like, how do we. Like getting speakers in or you know public debate. Mm -hmm. Americans don't do that kind of event very often anymore, but I think this does feel like a place for it. Okay, good, good, oh. excellent. Okay. Other questions or not even questions, but ideas, thoughts. If you don't go, what would make you go? Or um, I'm planning on going. Yeah, just this. When yeah. you got there, you know, I looked on the website, you know, just checked out who was coming and, and stuff. But just having all this here and then knowing all the categories that it covers, you know, you got a variety of things. It is isn't plays, it just isn't music or whatever. And so there, to me there's something for everybody. You know, you got comedy and theater and music, dance, film. And 
family shows, you know. So here's a so, question then. Go ahead. If if going so like Leslie just said, oh, I'm I'm gonna go. Um, but you might not have said that if Jeff hadn't been here and you hadn't been here, and you know. Yeah. So how how does the Sheldon get the word out to people in places that maybe they're not right now, so that people would be like, oh yeah, you know, maybe I think of that. So if you and your family and friends don't know about it or think about it, uh, is there a way that the Sheldon could, you know, because one one part about being accessible is that. You have things that come in, but the other part is just how, how you know getting the word out there. So I just wonder if if people have ideas. On Where do you put these? Like in the library? Yeah, they're the, they have the things. Yeah. They're around town. We've got a bunch in the lobby. Um, I don't do that, so I don't know what places oh, okay. they are. Um, but yeah, and then, it, and then it's like you know, what you put on the cover and like make it look as appealing as possible. Um, these guys are. The most famous group for that season, so that's how they got on there. Mm. Um, yeah, the, you know, I think what I think about a lot is I do think it's word of mouth. I think it's it's being like this and knowing like you you have like the friend who's going to kind of make it feel like oh well, it's, it's, I guess it's normal to go with the Sheldon. And I I think that we have to build up trust really because we have even um, our marketing director, her husband. Tree strings, the guitar store in town, and he had he was talking to one of his friends, and he's like, oh, yeah, they should have more, you know, smaller like you know Minnesota-based country bands there, or like you know Americana bands. And he's like, they do, they do. Look, here's look at it. And he's like, oh, I had no idea. So I think like you can take snapshots, and even you know what we did in this room a little while ago is like where you know your history started. I saw movies at the show, and you know you just moved to town. It's like everybody has their. I think they have a snapshot from when they came to town and what the Sheldon is and what, it, what it's for. And so I just have to grab everyone and be like, no, it's, it's this now. Mm -hmm. um, I thought it was just plays. That's it. Yeah. I had no idea it was all this at all. Yeah. It'd be expensive, but yeah. every household just had this. Yeah. I mean, if you open up to them, it's nice, it's on the center. You know, what, yeah. they, what they call that. But well, the, the and we do send out a postcard version that like the, of the next couple months of shows a few times a year yeah. And, um, yeah we're working on expanding that list printed mail stuff is really expensive right now mm -hmm. it's one of those things that got mailed with me with uh, yeah. the supply chain mm -hmm. but hopefully that comes down soon do y'all um, I'm not sure that I haven't been there but do y'all like be in the parades I was going to say you could just oh yeah. parades and stuff yeah, yeah. yeah. right <laughs> it's being kind of in places where Everybody, yeah, where, everybody where lots is. of people That's are. where everybody is. Holiday strolls, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. Well, got Santa during holiday strolls. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I didn't even know that. That's the thing. I have kids. I had no idea. I would normally take my kids up to the cities, and because I didn't know that Santa was even there. Yeah. yeah they they did a really nice job decorating the place out for the. Yeah. I, I was I was blown away by how good it looked for Santa. It was the it's the down down from Main Street. Is that oh, they, yeah. Oh, they, for the holiday store, yes. Yeah. yeah they they decorate the. Show yeah. for us. And, yeah, we're out, you know, uh, Fall Arts Festival. We have a show during that. Uh, and they're going to come out and do a, I guess, songwriting workshop outside in front of the building uh, during, you know, mm -hmm. during the Arts Festival. So we're trying. Mm -hmm. But this is, is it's going to be reminding. What's that? Is Santa's going to be there this year? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because when I go to the show, then <laughs> I'm with you, like the nerdy and some, uh, well, I have a good friend who likes to go to a lot of stuff, so they're always telling us what to go and we, whatever. But the crowd is older. You know, I'm always wishing, not wishing, like older people too, but um, as one who's getting older, but I just think of all the families and all the young people in town. You know, it, it does that feel, I don't know if it feels that way to you, and maybe it's based on, because I don't have little kids anymore, so I'm not going to those family ones anymore. But... It would be nice to have a, you know, I'm not looking at you like you're supposed to solve it, but I'm just yeah. wondering from this group who, you know, people have young kids or families or who know, you know, I just wonder where. Well, I will push back on that a little bit because I think it depends on the show. Yeah. And, and yeah. Like, we had uh, Hip Play, uh, say, a 
black uh, Chicago-based uh, ballet company in last mm -hmm. year, and it was a whole. The theater was full of small black girls in tutus, which I had That's never awesome. seen anywhere before, and it was like, God, like we, oh, what an amazing thing we did here. This yeah. is red white. Like, what is this? <laughs> I yeah. had uh, so it does depend on the show. It, I think it is that habit thing. It's the the Sheldon. I think the Sheldon in, for the five years before me, they really ran a project to see, okay, let's make this an elite arts venue, and it's like let's test the limits of how big of shows we can get in here, which is also testing the limits of how much people are willing to spend on tickets, and it worked. It it really like if you want that thing like. They're doing shows. They're selling tickets for 100 bucks or more at the, at the Sheldon, and really enough, you know, you get Jim Croce's son, or you, you, and so, but you also train the audience to think of the of the theater in a certain way. So now I need to shift it back and say it's not just that. So I think the older audiences have got the money for that, yeah. and it's easy to. You don't want to be, you know, I, my my dad worked for General Motors. Uh, so I think in terms of cars a lot, but like you don't want to be Cadillac 20 years ago, where it's like you're you're making the same thing for old people forever, and they all die, and you're doomed. <laughs> you know, so like, and but but for a while that feels great because those old people are they're loyal. They'll keep buying. They've got money. They you know what they want. It's really easy. Um, so it it is a project. It's hard. Uh, I'll spend my whole time here convincing folks that you no, know, really, it's for you. It, it's cheaper than you think it is. It's more fun than you think it is. Uh, and I'm, you know, absolutely open to advice. And I'll say before I forget, uh, we're recruiting for the board right now. There are two open positions at the end of this year. Um, anyone who lives in Red Wing can be on the on the board. Um, so there's an application process you can get to through our website, which is just you know it's it's a short form like who are you like why do you want to be on the board? Sign up seriously like I I'd love to see more. It's the board members are appointed by the mayor so. Um, I have some some poll there. I can I can say like oh I'm like here's some you know really <laughs> like not the usual people for our board. So yeah, definitely look at that. Yes. You could be my boss. Is what I'm telling you. It's always fun to be correct under board of directors. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. so. Um. I was going to ask before you just said what you said of are you looking for advice? Is that what you're hoping for? In thinking about getting other people in, so we did move to Red Wing in 2019, and what you said was the five years before you was for the jewel, it's spending, it's upper class sort of thing. That was what was said to me, like walking by getting a tour of that is what this is, we're bringing people in. So, in terms of wanting to kind of change that, Thinking and looking at all the ones here that are for kids, there's so many to do like a really colorful one page flyer and send it home with all the kids at school. Like kids are bringing me home, I, what is it, seventh day of school and I probably would stack this thick of flyers from community places of like family friendly activities that are going on. Yeah, they just have to come home in the backpack. <laughs> and so if it was a one pager with, um, the holiday movie and Missoula Children's Theater and all these other like really cool family things on there and just having the thumbprints of them and then put on there the range of prices so that families know like I can get into this for seven dollars up to twenty five um, or first kids free which I saw was on one of these um, so having that right there and then maybe on there saying um, I don't know if this is true, but if you could give free tickets if a family couldn't afford to, like... We do have something like that uh, through a grant from Excel. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember the details, um, but I, but it exists. And that's, a, that's another thing. There are so many... It's a little heartbreaking to hear you ask about it, because like, there's so many things that like we do that are cool, but it's really hard to get the, the word out about. Uh, so, including, it's not just that, it's also uh, a lot, a lot of our artists do workshops before their show. So last year, Jeremy Messersmith played at the, at the Sheldon, you know, big Minnesota artist. The, um, the afternoons, the two afternoons, like, of the show and the one before, he is over at Staghead teaching people the ukulele. Uh, you know, and it was like, just, you know, good to be one of eight people hanging out with this you know, famous Minnesota artist. So we're trying to get the word out about that, too. But yeah, I, mean, I should have brought Brenda, our marketing person, so she's mm -hmm. can pick up these ideas. 
Does downtown Main Street or the Chamber advertise for you in their social media pushes? I believe so, yeah. And, uh, yeah, there's lots of overlap between our board and our staff with those organizations too, so you know, we're, we work those angles when we can. Yeah, you can fly. Oh, yeah, introduce yourself. Oh, yeah, sorry. My name is Janet Santiago. I'm, you know, collaborate with a couple organizations here in town, outreach and Hispanic outreach, and Red Wing Wayne's game. I know it. Lots of stuff. Yeah, I I just, I just, um, Want to mention? She she mentioned about the little kids that you know. Usually, the teachers send the flyers to to the to, to the parents. But the, you know, for the high schoolers, uh, I was thinking you know a big poster for the you know four different events and just having in you know in the you know in the front door or I don't know where mm-hmm. they yeah, yeah mm-hmm. I'm not sure where. But the, I think so. The, the, it would be just a good idea to have that information at the school. I mean, uh, because some people, I mean, I talking about my kids, they like music, so, but you know, if they have the information in there, uh, you see it every day, oh, it's gonna be that day, oh, it, uh, they pass every day for the same place, right. it will be like a, yes. Have your kids and, emailed me about what music they want to see at the party? <laughs> and, um, you know, I don't know if you, uh, uh, Work with uh, you know partnership with uh, Hispanic Outreach. I, they they Lucy usually is amazing, and I have they they usually uh well, well like uh for example the concerts in the park mm-hmm. they advertise you know the the coming concert next Wednesday blah, 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 and they put a short video about the the group that uh, you know performance that they so I I don't know. <laughs> How, how you know how many people you know attend the event, but you know we are still you know we are we are aware about the event and what it is and what it's about. And, Do they put that on Facebook, Janet, or what? Uh, Facebook uh, or they how? Facebook. Yeah. They okay. use the Facebook. I mean, Hispanic outreach use the use the Facebook mm-hmm. for you know for most of the Hispanic families and they advertise it in Spanish. So um, I know. Uh, Everything is in English, and you know, kids get along with English. But you know, for the parents, it would be nice if they don't speak English. Just have the main information. I said that you don't have to translate everything. Just the main information, like at the event or the group or the performance, and you know, the cost of the ticket and what they. That's all. And we are we're still working on it for the advertising, but we do have a, a fluent Spanish speaker in the box office. Uh, so that's uh, we're making, making some progress. <laughs> Lucy told me something interesting once. I'm interested in, in kind of the whole room's opinion. You know, yours first maybe, but the, that part of the challenge of reaching for the Sheldon to reach out to the Hispanic community <laughs> is that she said that a lot of culture in Mexico and Central America, especially, is participatory. So people don't have a background in going to a venue and just sitting and being quiet and watching a thing. It's like, they, you know, like no, people go to a music show, they want to dance. And I, I'm trying to figure out, like, okay, so how do I make the, like, the shell of this architecturally isn't for that? And I'm trying to figure out, like, how do I make that thing work? So does that, does, does that make sense to you as a, like... Yeah, yeah, I know. It's, it's gonna take time to, you know, get used to it. But you know, I I've been to the Sheldon a couple of times with, you know, for the some groups uh, for the performance for the high school, and even a couple of years for the arts alive with oh, the little yeah. ones. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, but uh, um, yeah, but you know, what I mean is, you know, if you advertise with Hispanic outreach in the that way. That website or Facebook or I don't know Instagram or whatever they use. Uh, uh, I mean, um, the Hispanic community be aware about what happened in the shell, right. uh, what's going on, and that. So we'll see if it, it works uh, or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. But you know, you have have you know a couple you know uh, show say for kids and uh, we like to bring our kids to the event. So cool. you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's good. So, Alexi, you've got young, young kids. 
Where would you find it? Where would you see it? I mean, now you know, but let's say you were just wandering around, or you're just doing your thing. Where would I? Where would you? Yeah. yeah, but and even if you saw that, would it make you go, or would you want? You know, I'm I'm really trying. Like, I just think promotion because you do have such good shows. That's what you're saying. So that might. You already have that. It's sort of getting people in the door. And well, and I wonder if the question is, it's not so much like where you see it, but I wonder if like, oh, so like you see something for the Sheldon. You see like, so, you know, family show Lightwire. So if you were to see a poster for, for Lightwire here, what would be, what would you assume? Like if you decided like, oh, I'm not going to go to that. Like, what's, the, what's the problem in your head? Is it like, is it cost? Is it like, what do you think it's going to be like? If you don't think it's for you, does that make sense as a question? Because I can see, like, you know, if I'm walking past the Guthrie, like, I was like, oh, that's the tickets are going to be eighty bucks, like, mm-hmm. you know. That's <clears throat> But how would people know? So unless they pick up this mm-hmm. brochure, which it's dark, and you, you know, you might just pass it right by. Yeah, you know what I mean? Really colorful. Because I would catch either mine or my kids' eyes, so one of the two. Yeah, and so you might not, you might see the cover of that and not think that there are all kinds of cool, cool family kids stuff in it, for example, or whatever. Yeah, like I So are there posters that go up for like, I mean, it would be hard, but just like individual, yeah. Brenda does a lot, there's the kiosk right there. Yeah. And we're, we do a lot of like, there's the here because there's a lot of music that you know you maybe haven't heard of. Uh, so we just you can sit and listen to a playlist of the full Sheldon season. Uh, just get a, a taste of these artists. So we're that's you really know, cool. We're trying stuff. A Spotify playlist. Yeah. So I think it's a yeah and then we always do whatever there's like a band coming out we do a, a QR link to their you know to a playlist of just their music to introduce. Hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, the, the hard thing for the, for the Sheldon in building up an audience is that because it's so diverse, because we have to be the Guthrie and First Avenue and the Ordway, and is that somebody could come in and see, you know, I, I don't know, like this Irish comedy tour. Like, oh, I love stand up. When is the next time I can see a show like that? Like, well, three months from now, you know, because, you know, next weekend it's bluegrass. And then after that, it's you know it's a you know stunt dog show, so like it's hard to sustain a. This is the kind of thing. What is that noise? Yeah. You know, Isn't that a weird noise? Like a drill. A drill. Oh, oh, sorry, I was just like, yeah. am I here? No. <laughs> just me. I okay. Okay. Like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Jeff. I just no. couldn't. Cut. I was like, Corey. Oh, what? Oh, I was looking at Corey. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, okay, um, okay. But yeah, so it, it is a, th- that's another challenge of the Sheldon, it's just like, you, you can't say, oh, I really thought yeah. someone singing at first. Uh, <laughs> but you get the idea. You go that's ahead, right. you should, no, no, keep going. Okay. Okay. The store. I just told them that, uh, you know, a couple of years uh, when my kids were in the Bernstein School, I just said, you know, with the application of the free meal. I received yeah. a letter with a shell on that, you know, uh, I can get, you know, like a card and, yeah. you know, I can buy tickets 77 percent off of the cost. Are you still doing that? No. We, I think that's one of the things that's being rent back up post-COVID. Oh. Um, that, all the partnerships with the schools, it's that and field trips, and it seems like everything just fell apart during, mm-hmm. during the pandemic. And now there's been a, all of, so much staff turnover at the schools. So a lot of that is we're just figuring out who we need to talk to and then you're kind of rebuilding those things. So it's, it's all on the way back. Yeah, we're, you know, inside the Sheldon, there's like, only five of us who work there. We're pretty fast about, about running with new ideas, but whenever we have to work with an outside organization, especially <coughs> in schools or something, then it, it, it tends to slow down a bit. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I, I'm impulsive to a fault. <laughs> I think maybe, you know, I don't know how much the people who've lived here a long time know about the variety that you have here. But I think new people coming in, like Alexis said, 
you know, I didn't know you had all this different stuff there. You know, I thought it was just Yeah, I was going to say, Lexi's lived her whole life. I didn't hear, no, I didn't live here my and whole life. And somebody sees, you know, the show in the theater, they may just think, well, it's just plays, you know. Yeah. But when you show them that music and comedy and film and all the other stuff, you know, I'm guessing yeah. Seth's not really going to owe Michelle a lot of favor for getting me out of here. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember if it was you or Michelle that posed the question of like what is preventing you from going or what, what would yeah. you need to go. And I, I feel like in the last three years, in just in general, people's anxiety has gone up a lot. And so things that people want to know are... What's the price? What does the venue look like that I'm going into? Where do I park? Like doing a social media push of this is what your experience will be like when you come to the show. And you can wear your jeans. This is where you can park at. This is where your seat might be. Look how beautiful and like not all at once, but have little short videos or something of like, let me introduce you to the Sheldon. Yeah. That is very cool. Yeah, because that's that is the hardest thing. Something that we uh, we didn't know of in, the, in a similar vein. Just last week, uh, somebody came in. I think it was a tourist on one of the boats, and just asked us what this building was. And we realized there's no sign on the building to tell you what it is. <laughs> like there's a very small plaque, and if you look way up the top, it says TV Sheldon, but there's nothing otherwise. Uh, so, you know, we, but it's like, you know, you work somewhere for more than a month, you don't, you can't see any of that anymore. So, yeah, that is the kind of thing, we would have never thought of doing that ourselves. It's just like, yeah, we can shoot a video, there's a parking ramp right behind the building, you can see it from the front doors. That's, so, yeah, good one, I'll take that. I had no idea, I thought I was alone in the anxiety of knowing where to park and, like, not going places without knowing the parking situation. I realize it's super common, like, that is a really common fear that people have of, like, where's my car going to go when I go to this venue with hundreds of thousands of people? Not that enough people will be here, but... Well, to show how smart you are, I once uh, saw a, a speech by a really famous uh, theater manager out of D.C., and he said, like, his most recent gig at Arena Theater out there was as their marketing director, and the first thing he did was took up the parking ramp. And he said, this is the first experience people have when they come here. And if, they're, if they come in and they have a horrible experience in the parking ramp, they're ruined for the rest of the night. Mm -hmm. So you're, you know, you're right. That is, that's part of the experience. Mm -hmm. We can do some cool things in the parking ramp. Uh, um, I was thinking that, yeah, the Seminary Plaza. Yeah. One, I mean, that's not what it's called. It's the downtown plaza parking lot or something. Yeah, okay, no, they've done some called. really cool art really? stuff in parking lots. Oh, yeah. They've done phenomenal. I've got, yeah. <laughs> I was thinking, I, mm -hmm. I've got lots of pages of those. Holy They're very cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Paint and fun things that kids can do on their way in and out, like hopscotch and different things. Anyway, mm -hmm. this isn't my point, but yeah. <laughs> But that's a really great idea to keep, kind of have a series of things, things that make you feel like oh, yeah. Yeah. you know, little shorts. And doing things like you have a tagline like you belong here or everyone is welcome here mm -hmm. or something along those lines. One of my staff just went to training and she came back and said one of the workshops she went to was all about how to make people feel like they belong. Like the space that you're in is a place that you belong and you accept it as you are when you come into the space. Which it sounds like is what you want to have there. Yeah, there's a there's a lot of science around that. Like that you you know you really go by like the first ten seconds. Like immediately when you walk in, you can like um, there's all sorts of like retail design around that. Like can you know giving people the right impression when they come in. You know the impression when you come into the shelter and you're in a really tiny box. <laughs> we're stuck with this whole architecture, but. Yeah, we're yeah, working on it. So, yeah, because yeah, you said at the beginning, Jeff, like, it's for you. You know, this place is for you. So, yeah. Yeah, I always... That, tagline again. Yeah. That, that great something when people try to write that uh, that tagline, because it's it always comes off as... Cause, like, Park Square Theater in St. Paul, it's their tagline is, theater for you. Yes, you. And <laughs> like, oh, come on, Dad. <laughs> you know, like, so... It's hard, it's hard to do it and still sound like, so, 
Yeah, I, I want something a little, a little sneakier. Like, so I don't want to come out and say it. It's got to be something that gives me the impression of what, yeah, I'll work on that. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything that you would like feedback from, from people? I mean, is, are there any questions that you have for this group that you're thinking, oh, I kind of wish I could ask someone this or that, or just, you know? I, I ask, you know, I, I think I've done most of them, but definitely, like, I am, I am serious about taking uh, show recommendations. Um, I love partnerships, so I did one with, with Hispanic Outreach to bring in Forte to Wallace. I think we talked about that before you came in. But, you know, Hope Coalition, you're on my list. Um, you know, if you're if you're folks like if there's a show or lecture or anything, and this isn't like I promise when I talk about this stuff, I don't want anything from you but the idea. Like I would love to promote your organizations. I would love to like build community here and like so like you know so yeah if you you know if your folks have an idea like want to bring in a show, I I'll do it. I'll promote Hope Coalition, um, and that's you know anyone. You know, I, I want input from the community on, on what's on that stage. Because uh, like, how cool is that? And you're like, oh, you know, we picked that. And, you know, so, um, yeah, and absolutely not a sponsorship deal or anything. It's just like, I, I'll take your advice. Because it's, it's a lot of, you know, a lot of weekends to fill. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I want to see more, you know, more, I hate saying diverse because it's like never sincere when people in my position say that. It's like, what? I just want so many, you know, all the different people. So far, it looks like you got a laugh. <laughs> 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 oh my God, I'm yeah. I asked Michael if it was okay to say this, but he had said in a previous meeting of wanting to bring in slam poetry into Red Wing, and so I asked if I could say it tonight, and he emphatically said, yes, please do. <laughs> so, good. It's a, it's a big room for that. Like, there are certain art forms that just work better in a smaller space, and I think that might be one of them. So, we do have the studio space upstairs. Um, yeah, there's this whole thing. I'm, I'm not sure I'm convinced by this, but there's a belief, stand-up comedians have a belief that comedy doesn't work in spaces with tall ceilings. Um, so, I, I think it works at the Sheldon, which, which breaks the rule. If you, go, if you go to comedy clubs, it's a really, like, it's, they always have really low ceilings for that reason, because they, they all have that same belief. How big is your, your the what do you call the studio? What do you call the third the new third the, floor room? Yes, yeah, studio. It's studio. Uh, how big is it? Like compared to this room that we're in right now, how big um, is it? Um, this room plus half that way, I think. Oh really? Roughly. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah, and that's a rehearsal space slash event space. So we're having a little VIP reception for a couple shows, and we're doing that upstairs. It was built. This is hard for me because it, it was conceived by someone who's not me, and now I, I have this thing that is kind of unusual for a theater that I'm, I'm trying to figure out, okay, so how do I use this? Mm -hmm. uh, because they, the Sheldon, one of the ideas for building out that space was, we'll have these fancy dinners with Blue Dog to cater, and you can spend an extra 60 bucks and have dinner before the show, and I'm not a spend an extra 60 bucks for a fancy dinner and be a VIP at the theater kind of guy, as you may have guessed. So I don't, I don't want to do that. It's not the, the jeans and t-shirt experience I want for the show. Room. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking for how to, how to use that room in different ways. Would you, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so when you say a studio, what do you, like I'm confused. So <laughs> it's just just a, like a big open room. Yeah. There's probably just more than that. Huh? Line, right? Oh, is there? It's it doesn't need space. Yeah, it doesn't feel so different from this. Um, okay. It has a, a sprung dance floor, uh, so you could do dance performances up there. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that part of the idea for it was that you would have performances up there, but it's not soundproof well enough, so you can't have something up there and on the main stage at the same time. Mm -hmm. Which, but um, studio, it is a term of art for um, you know in theater, like. Basically, the, the small room, you know, you know, like the smaller performance space in a theater, we always call a studio. So it's not like a TV studio or anything, it's just a, a smaller mm -hmm. room. Do you have conversations with um, like artists or sort of after? Okay. No. Yeah, <laughs> I thought it was you know, like after. Because what I was thinking was like, you know, like a small studio where people can like, you know, like have their own space. 
do the artist rap, whatever. Sure. Like, I was like, we don't have yeah. anywhere in Red Wing like that. Like, do podcasts, whatever. Like, we have nothing to do that. That's why that. so I was like, hmm, but yeah. it's too yeah. big. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, because I was just thinking, like, we have nothing like that here. Like, people might want to make a podcast. Oh, well, you got to go to the cities for that. Or, oh, people might want to record, you know, some music some or do something like Bye. that. I like I like where you're going with that. That yeah. we could have a like a, a arts maker space. Yeah, that's what I was, that's I was just thinking about that because there's no way for that, and I want to make podcasts. That's why I kind of know a little bit about that. But it's like there's no where where people can go record music or go and record a podcast or do something artsy like that either. Well, what about uh, Universal Music Center though for recording music? Would that not is that not totally done? Um, well, Universal Music Studio, I'm looking around to see if anyone knows more than I do. I, I mean, I he know. teaches, so like, they teach, right? Mm-hmm. They teach all the instruments really, really yeah. well. Uh, they play sometimes there, but I don't, I don't, I don't it's not a recording yeah. studio, but, and it's, and I have. That's, yeah, watch out, I'm going to be calling you to run it. Art maker <laughs> space, an art maker space. Uh, I, I like yeah that is that is so right right and that would right. also get younger kids people yeah to come by just this is so great fun. that's brilliant I love it sometimes like the wheels you turn that's awesome <laughs> no that is fantastic cool There's a, uh, okay. yeah the website has just one picture is all <laughs> the theater. Well, yeah, it did, we, there's a few. Uh, it depends on what page you're on, but yeah, it, it loads it, because of uh, the, it loads different on mobile as well. Oh, okay. But, you know, but I would think more price. people are probably going to look at it on their phone than any other device. Well, but so this room is big enough where you could put in if someone wanted to at some point, like a, re, a little recording thing, like he's talking about you know, and it's, still have space to like get together and jam out or I'll tell you it was half built up for that thing already because uh, in uh, Little Shop of Horrors the guy who voiced the plants uh, was up there uh, with a uh, mic you know a mic rig and he was he was voicing the plant up there you could see the stage uh, so it's it's been done already the, the space is really wired for a lot of technology stuff be on something here. Yay. Okay. Well, good. Yeah. So, yeah, be careful before you tell me any ideas because I, I really may just. <laughs> well, that's it. That's, that's, sure. that's what we're. Like yeah. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of kids that can't get up to the cities to do all that, and that's like the closest place. Or maybe Rochester. I don't. Know. I don't. I go to the cities. So I don't know about Rochester, but I'm sure maybe. Mm-hmm. But it's just like you know, like you do what do you like in the cities that's not here? A lot. <laughs> I, mean, I and I live in Minneapolis, like you know, right. Like I, you know, no, I uh, normally I go there just for like kids stuff because down here. I mean, we have a limited kids thing, so um, and then really I just like I said, um, just like podcast stuff. Um, go to studio with some people sometimes um, and go right. dance, <laughs> go <laughs> out. <laughs> um, that's really all I go for though, I mean like with my friends. Come on in, come on in. How are you next? I um, go to the zoo and stuff. Oh, but you're not telling me to open a zoo upstairs. Well, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. You can pull that off. That'd be awesome. That'd be really, that'd be something. Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, and you said, like, uh, the job that like, people dances and stuff like that. So, I was just like. Spot. Right there. Hmm? You could do it in that room that. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I think my turn is up. I'm going to get overwhelmed with new ideas. Here, so yeah, yeah. yeah, no, that's right. good. I'm glad. But, okay. all right. Well, thank you all for having me. And for we jumped down notes, and then we actually sent um, them to you. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. All well, those good ideas. All right, and, yeah, send me a list of what would a podcasting studio need. Um, and 
yeah, you guys are easy to find. So if you got ideas after this, like, oh, I should have told him to do this, or, you know, Jay Larson at ShelvinTheater.org. Good. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want me to send Jeff's information to everybody? Yep, I will do that. And um, thank you so much for coming. Okay, thank you. Okay, see you later. Okay, to the group. Hi, Kyle. Hi. Okay. So we just had a good session with Jeff. Oh no, it's wherever. Nope, we have a we have a small group. Okay. Okay, yeah, we'll take a we'll take a three minute three minute break. I'll put this on pause. Actually, neighbors, I guess that's not. Do you know this, Kyle? Maybe that's good. <laughs> Steve lives right on the corner. Of, yeah, say this. Here. <laughs> you want to slow the room? Well, well, you don't have to. <laughs> we will at the end. We will at right. the end. Right. Seven to the east. All right. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Roy Goblin, um, grew up here and um, has been involved in quite a few different um, renovation and planning projects through different committees and um, groups that have been put together over the years. So mm-hmm. yeah. It's been, been fun to be part of and, and work at the work across the street. And unfortunately for Corey, he has to. Um, uh, manage my two kids, <laughs> my two boys. <laughs> Do they work awesome. there? Oh, that's so great. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Well, there you go. I can't believe how like all of a sudden they're just like <laughs> small town. <laughs> <laughs> they're like these men now. Like, oh, <laughs> yeah, okay. yeah. I was <laughs> Good kids. <laughs> um, yes, I'm Sarah Kern. Um, I'm the executive director of the Coalition. Didn't know that I needed to know about so many things until now, so I'm excited you're here. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Janice Santiago. Um, I have been living in Jerwin for, I would say, 14 years. So, yeah, I've been collaborating with some organizations and committees here in Jerwin. Okay. Yeah. And Lexi DeVries is coming back, and Lexi's been here her whole life, and she'll introduce herself. So. Anyway, yeah. So once you come, yeah, just tell us a little bit about all the things you do. It's a really big. Your job has like all these different tentacles coming from it. So well, I can start with some. myself a little bit to introduce yeah. myself. So I have lived in Red Wing for oh about um, twenty five years now. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> So I moved down here and I grew up in the um, kind of Twin Cities metro area, East, East Metro. Um, and then took a job down here working for Brian, like we were talking about, Peterson. Interned with him and then eventually that led to a full-time position um, and worked there for four or five years. Uh, then went down and worked in Lake City for a while. Uh, I was their planning director um, for about six, seven years. Then took a job up in Lake Elm, which is my hometown, uh, which was challenging to say the least because of the politics up there and some of the growth issues they were going through. But I lasted there for about eight years. Um, then uh, jumped down to Rosemount, Minnesota, was their senior planner for about five years and then uh, took this job and came open uh, last year. So I've been here about uh, in my current role as community development director for about a year now. I think I started September 13th of last year. That's exactly then. So that time has blown by. <laughs> so. Yeah, so I'm very happy to be here. So, did you want to jump back to do one more introduction? Yeah, Lexi, just introduce yourself. We went around and introduced. That's it. Okay. That's it. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So then we just waited because Kyle's going to kind of explain all the stuff because he has a. It feels like sometimes a million things under his purview. So he's going to explain about all the things he does, and then we'll just get into it like we did before. So, I am community community development director, so I'm in charge of the community development department. And so that includes several different functions. The three main ones are building inspections, so that's our building official and his staff, and they carry out um, or issue building permits, um, and then do a lot of reviews on plans for new buildings and construction. (coughs) So, 
a lot of you, if you have had to, you know, get a building permit for something, whether it's putting on a deck or placing a window um, or whatever, you know, you'd be dealing with our, our building official. Um, so that's one area of our department. The other is planning and zoning. So planning and zoning uh, deals with the city's zoning ordinance and regulations, which you know, we were talking about just a little while ago, and we'll talk about more in the future. Um, and covers a broad range of activities, um, you know, for permitting the city. And so that department, um, you know, it, it, there's a whole list of permits that they, they issue and, and deal with. It's everything from, um, you know, issuing permits for bed and breakfast, for what we call conditionally permits, where people want to do something that isn't necessarily permitted in the district, but they have to go and get a permit from the city to do. Uh, they deal with platting a property, subdividing a property, so when somebody wants to split their lot, they come in and talk to us, and we help them kind of work through that process. There's permits they need to get to do that. Um, other things are, um, let's see here, rezonings, change the zoning on a piece of property to something different. Uh, we deal with amendments to the code. We deal with variances, so when somebody had, wants to do something on, on their property and they can't meet the requirements of our, our code and regulations, one of the options they have is to apply for a variant from the city. So for instance, we have setbacks that are required. Whenever you build a house, it has to be set back a certain distance, or if you put up, add on to a house or structure, it has to be set back. Uh, sometimes people can't meet those requirements, so they'll ask for a variant from the city. Um, so we process those, those permits as well. So uh, that ends up being you know, a lot of different things in a lot of different areas that we're involved with. And then the final kind of leg of what we do is, is under economic development. So I oversee our Port Authority, which is the city's economic development agency. And so the economic development agency is really charged with promoting um, business activity and supporting businesses in the community, but also supporting economic activity, which can mean a lot of different things from helping businesses uh, succeed in the community, helping to retain businesses, uh, but also getting involved in other things like you know, making sure we have good parks and uh, good streets, uh, get people where they want to go and give people things to do, uh, or it could be helping promote housing and different types of housing in the community, um, both from uh, you know, just increasing the supply, but also helping make, making sure that housing is affordable. Uh, and then another kind of aspect of the Port Authority is that because we are on a river and we have an active river, there are certain things that, that the Port does to help manage and control um, activity along the riverfront. So, we own a bulkhead facility, which is just basically a place where um, uh, materials get shipped to and from the river, and um, you know includes loading and unloading those materials. Uh, that bulkhead is actually the south end of town, where the uh, NSP garbage burner plant is, uh, kind of on the east end, right on the riverfront. Uh, the port's also you know involved with doing dealing with some of the leases for the marinas on the riverfront, and helping uh, just kind of promote general activity and economic development along our waterfront. So that's another kind of big area that, that we're, we're involved with. Um, and then there's a few other kind of smaller things that, that we do in our department. Uh, our planning and zoning manager does uh, staff the city's Her Heritage Preservation Commission. Uh, they're charged with you know, adopting, maintaining, and enforcing rules related to preservation of historic structures in the community. So we have a few different districts uh, that are defined as historic districts where if you're doing something or changing your building, there are permits you need to come in and apply for in order to um, do your work. So the Kaplan's, uh, they're located within one of these, these districts, so when there's work being done at the outside of that building, you're typically coming in and having to go through this process. So they're a little different because it's a newer building, so there's some exceptions, you know, in cases where there's newer construction in those areas, but uh, that's one of the other areas that we deal with. And then finally, um, under our supervision, or under my supervision, is the city's licensing um, manager. And so that position deals with a lot of the city's licensing um, issues and requirements. So uh, when people need parking passes or um, I think I don't know, the dog licenses come up here, um, I'm not even sure yet because there's so many things that she ends up doing that I'm, I'm still kind of catching up on what all she's involved with and the kinds of permitting um, um, things that she does. Uh, another example for her is that you know she'll process and handle all of our tobacco licensing. So for the businesses that have uh, tobacco, uh, those licenses need to go through her, and those are done every year and renewed on a regular basis. And I think just kind of as a quick overview, and I know it's a lot, um, you know, one of the things that we do is, is uh, we also um, are in charge of our rental housing inspection program. This is a new activity that was just started um, as of January 1st of this year. So the city now has a program um, that requires the inspection of all rental properties. It has some requirements, you know, for obtaining and getting a you know, uh, permit. Uh, to continue to um, operate um, rental housing in, in the city. This is the first year that we've been doing this. We've been kind of working on ramping up that program. Uh, we just did a presentation last or this week in front of council 
uh, on an update just to where we've been with that program. But uh, the city is divided up into different zones, uh, and we've been kind of scheduling inspections based on the zone each each property is in. So it's going to be a very continued long process for us to get out there and inspect all the properties. But eventually, the goal is that all rental properties in the community will, will have an inspection. Uh, you know, that inspection is checking for really basic life, health, health and safety issues. You know, making sure there's working smoke detectors and fire alarms in the property. There aren't open wires or electrical hazards in the structure. Uh, so those sorts of things. And again, the idea behind the program is really to help promote and encourage and uh, maintain, um, you know, housing in the community that's safe um, for all, all people. So those are kind of the big areas uh, that we have. Um, so I don't know if you want me to kind of get into some of the projects we're working on now or uh, let's see, let's about... first find out what people might be interested in, and then, okay. uh, I don't know, I guess, it, maybe Kyle, you could, I mean, we have a little bit of time, maybe you could talk about some of the projects that you're working on that you think that this group yeah, might be interested in. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. as an example. Yep, yep. Um, you can tell Kyle doesn't have a lot of free time. <laughs> he has a lot that he's already done. Just think off the top of my head here, I, I think some of the big things we're doing this year is, um, one thing that's kind of interesting is we are going to be doing a parking study downtown. Uh, we have had a lot of interest in some development downtown um, with adding some new residential and apartments in the downtown. And hopefully there'll be some more commercial activity too taking place. Uh, but one of the things we constantly hear is that you know, there's, there's parking issues in and around the downtown. Uh, usually those tend to be centered around certain areas or certain events taking place. So I'm sure as Jeff would tell you that when there's an event happening at the hotel and the, it always comes up about where, where, where we park, where is parking, when people are parking on the street, they're taking up space in front of businesses, so uh, those kind of things. Um, so I think we're intending to really kind of get a handle on what the demand is, where we can maybe accommodate more parking to accommodate different types of uses, and how to ensure that the parking you know, is there that the businesses need to, to thrive and, and be successful in downtown. Um, and things have changed a lot. We, I think we last did a study like this maybe 20 years ago. And just the way businesses operate and the type of businesses we have are vastly different. So as you kind of look around downtown now, you'll see that there is not a lot of office uses taking place or existing. Uh, the Associated Bank building has, has been sitting empty for a long time. Uh, the Red Wing Shoe Company has a large office presence downtown, presence downtown, but they have not been, I think most of their staff still hasn't returned back to the office. It doesn't sound like uh, they're going to be going back to the office anytime in the near future. So, you know, I, I think we're seeing kind of a different a trend in how people are actually working too, where you don't have as many people actually working downtown. Now, conversely, you know, we still have a pretty large um, amount of commercial activity downtown, and we're seeing more housing happening downtown too. And that's just creating a different demand for parking, whether it's different demand time, different areas, so all that sort of stuff. So that's something I think it's gonna be kind of interesting to see how that study goes, and um, hopefully there's gonna be some public participation in, in chances for people to come in and, and kind of share their experiences about what they're seeing in downtown and what they'd like to see come out of the study. Um, another project that's kind of interesting we're working on is, is Jordan Court. So if you're familiar with the court area outside of Mandy's the restaurant, uh, there's this little walkway that has tables and such, and then the court area itself, there's some parking in the middle with, I think, some trees that just got planted. Um, but what's interesting about that court area is that it's, it's privately, for the most part, it's privately owned, but we've, the city's had an agreement with those owners to maintain that area as more of a public space. So that parking's available, available for people to use and, and so forth. Um, but it's kind of well overdue to have some kind of upgrade and, and some enhancements. It's uh, in kind of rough shape, I mean, to put it uh, bluntly. Uh, so we actually got a grant uh, from one of the local foundations to do a study uh, to look at ways to help spruce up that area. Uh, so that work is being done right now by our consultant. They're coming up with some new drawings and ideas and we're going to be shopping that out and having people respond to that uh, in the next, uh, you know, four to six weeks or so. So we're excited to see maybe some new ideas and, and some new um, uh, improvements for that Jordan Court area in the heart of our downtown. Uh, we still need to come up with funding for that, so that's something that we'll be kind of talking about and thinking through. But that's potentially another project that, that's on the horizon uh, for the city that, that our, our department's been involved in. Um, another project that hopefully you all are familiar with is the Memorial Park Overlook. Um, that was a project that our department was kind of leading in terms of uh, managing the work that, that's happening and going on up there, uh, both from the planning work to figure out what that was going to look like, and then actually implementing it and actually constructing it. So we're kind of nearing the completion of that. I know it looks complete right now, but there's a few other things we're working on. Um, there's going to be some uh, new monuments or pillars going up to help mark um, 
you know, the, the people that dedicated or, or provided money for the project. Um, and then there's some artwork uh, going up at the base of the flag pole. So those two things are ongoing, uh, should be happening hopefully in the next few weeks here, so there will be some little more activity uh, going on up there. Um, for other projects, more on the Port Authority side, um, you know, we have been, um, let me back up a little bit. So you're familiar with, there's, there's work ongoing on Old West Main Street. Um, the city has been involved in a project to redo Old West Main, uh, which includes redoing the street, um, redoing the parking, adding in landscaping, and then eventually there will be additional um, amenities on that stretch, including trees, benches, and some uh, wayfinding signage and so forth. Um, prior to starting that project, um, the Bowerville, a uh, former Bowerville Tire Building, uh, came up for sale. So the city, working with the port, actually ended up buying that building. And the city did that for a couple different reasons. One was to um, you know, help provide parking for the, uh, while the, the work Does was happening. Does everybody know where that is? Does everybody know where that is? It's kind of like, a, what is it across from? So it's across from where Kelly's and uh, the Bayside Tavern are, and where, if you're familiar with the new pedestrian bridges, it's right across from that. So it's, it's a building that's been vacant for, I think, about five, four or five years now, it's I like think. It's like painted white, cement block, kind of just. Nothing was the to move right next to the sidewalk, and then the building sits back. Yeah. So just picture that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, go ahead. So sorry. Just wondering. Yeah. 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 So I don't know So the city ended up purchasing that building partly to provide parking uh, for the businesses while the street construction was going on. Um, so you'll see this big sign up saying public parking that's been available and I think as we talked to businesses they were very appreciative of having that space. But then the city um, charged the port as the economic development authority to find a new use and redevelop that, that building. Uh, so we've been working in a process here for the past, it's been before my time even, uh, to try to find a developer to come in and redevelop that building and bring new activity into that area. Um, one of the first things we did, or prior to doing that, we did a study looking at that area and uh, to develop a plan for how that building could be used. So that plan really looked at that building and said, you know, what we want to see there is something that would bring more activity but would complement the other users around it. So what they anticipated was maybe a food hall or something with, with a restaurant and some other activity or some other retail that was more destination that would bring people into the community. Um, but in addition to that, um, it noted that there's some good opportunities for the city to add parking uh, to that whole corridor. So the city was going to split out part of the lot and make some parking, but also create maybe a plaza in the front of the building that could be used for people to sit and kind of gather and tie in nicely with the pedestrian bridge and some of the other improvements on Old West Main. So that's kind of been the plan we've been working off of and um, uh, kind of working through trying to attract um, uh, folks into the building. We've had some interest from local businesses that maybe had an interest in locating that, that structure. Um, and then we've had some other interest from outside the community as well. So we're still working through that process. The port was presented with one option to work with the developer that wanted to do a food hall and would do some other things to the building, uh, but also had received a local business that wanted to move their retail business into that shop. Uh, they directed us to work with that retail business to come up with a plan and then present that as well to have that considered. So. What we're hoping is that by you know in the next four to six weeks or so, we'll have a plan from somebody that wants to use that building and then really work through the process of uh, eventually selling the building and working with them on a project to redevelop that building. Um, so just from an economic development perspective, that's just an example of one of the things we do to try to help um, promote reuse and activity within buildings within, within the community. Um, so we've had kind of a long range uh, vision for downtown. Downtown's been one of our focus points. Uh, with the port in, in terms of trying to, again, uh, add some energy and uh, maybe reinvigorate the downtown area. Uh, so there's been several buildings, or a few buildings that have been vacant for a little while, including the Associated Bank building, and we've had conversations, and have kind of been the entity in the city that's been talking to developers looking at Everybody those sites. This Associated Bank, it's so associated, the, yep, yep, okay. the building right downtown, yeah. So another project that's, that's pending that's gonna be coming forward here, um, hopefully shortly, is um, right across the street from City Hall, uh, as you go n south, north of this building. Uh, is, there's a Mike's Barbershop, and there's a tattoo parlor right next to it. Uh, we've had somebody purchase that building with the intent of putting up a 36 unit apartment building. Uh, so we're working with them on kind of working through that, that approval process. Um, but because of the kind of nature of doing projects in the downtown, in a situation where you're redeveloping a building, uh, those costs end up being really expensive, uh, or a lot more expensive than if you were just 
building somewhere where it's a flat piece of land, open, and uh, there aren't any issues. Uh, so what we've seen with a lot of the projects that have come in is that those costs are higher. So the developers are typically asking for some assistance um, from the city to make those projects realistic and viable in the market. Uh, so we're approaching this one in two ways. One is, um, you know, there, there's a tool called tax increment financing. You may have heard people talk about it, and I, I don't know if we have enough time to get into all the details of how it exactly works, but that's one of the tools that might that is being considered for use on that property to make that, that building work. We've also applied for some grants through the state uh, for doing redevelopment projects like this that helps the city pay for, and the developer pay for things like demoing the building, doing uh, site rem remediation where there's certain things that have to be dealt with on the property like poor soils or substandard soils um, and some infrastructure improvements to help provide you know, the infrastructure needed to serve that building like sewer, water, and then uh, stormwater. So those are all things we're kind of working on to kind of make that, that project happen. But that's an that's a example of a project that we're hoping you'll see some additional discussions on between the city and the Port Authority on the next, uh, again, next month or so here. That should be moving forward. Okay. So those are just a couple of the, the big projects as an example of some of the things that we do. Um, but again, like Michelle was saying, our art department covers a lot of different activities. So it's we, we sometimes um, you know get a lot of requests that come in that people don't know where they go. Um, so we do end up being fairly involved in helping kind of work on park planning and park projects, and um, you know working on things like street projects and, and other things we have going on in the community. So that's a and lot. We've also to talked throw a lot in this group about, or some in this group about, you know, what if you want to start a business or bringing in businesses or you know different kinds of businesses. So if you have any questions for Kyle about things that you or your friends or family have talked about that has anything to do with housing, business, pretty much, um, well, everything, inspections. Now's the time to ask. So. Uh, or anything that you've heard in the community too. <laughs> so you talked about working to bring someone into the Bauer building, is that right? Yes. So the other, the car wash that they just turned into that triplex, is that something that you, your team or group is trying to attract people there too? Not as directly. So in that situation, there was a private landowner um, that either purchased or owned the building. Um, and then decided to go forward with improvements to their structure. Um, so they you know, did these, these renovations, uh, which really helped fix up that building, and it looks a lot better now, obviously, if you remember what the car wash used to look like. Uh, but they've been trying to bring in businesses to that, that site, and so they'll talk to you know, different businesses that might have an interest in locating in, in that structure. And from time to time, we'll get calls. People will call us and ask, hey, do you know something that's available? You know, I have a business I want to locate. I'm looking for this much space or looking for this type of area. And then you know we try to have an understanding and, and or a list or um, you know some familiarity with the buildings that are available. So we will oftentimes send them to this this property owner to talk and, and see if they can work something out. But that one we probably were less involved in, um, other than you know because it was a, a project where they were changing the use of the building and then changing and doing things on the site. There were permits from our office that they had had to secure. So in that case, the private landowner, uh, private owner, came in, uh, made an application for a new, basically a new site plan for that property, and that was reviewed and approved by by our office. And I can't remember on that one if that required, you know, like our planning commission or council to sign off on it. Do we? What? Um, one question we've had is if someone did want to start a new business and they were just a, a small, small. Um, group. Who who would they who would they go to or talk to or get some information about? Yeah. Support yeah. It depends on what they're planning on doing, the type of business, and where they're looking at locating. A lot of times, because we we don't we don't necessarily have resources to provide directly to a business unless you're looking at a specific site or property. Uh, we'll refer those businesses over to the Ignite uh, office. So Red Wing Ignite. Um, is a, um, I don't know how to describe them, it's an organization that works to promote entrepreneurship and um, you know, businesses in the community. So they tend to have a few more resources where they can help directly with, um, again, either entrepreneurs or somebody that wants to start a business. You know, part of what they do is helping counsel, helping provide guidance and, and advice you know, for starting a business and, and, and doing that. 
Um, but we often work very closely with them, you know, in cases where they have an individual that wants to do something and is looking for space. You know, we can help them, you know, try to find and identify good locations or spaces where they may be able to go. Um, or, you know, conversely, once they get to the point where they have a business and they're up and running, uh, we can help provide, you know, some financial um, assistance, um, as the case may be. But as, as I, I reminded of time and time again, we don't lend directly to individuals um, unless there's another bank or somebody else involved in lending to start up a business. Uh, so we don't provide direct incentives to businesses, but we kind of come in as a secondary lender when they you know, are working with a bank, um, but need some additional help you know, for either making improvements to a building, uh, buying equipment, or doing those sorts of things. So it's very, it really depends on the type of situation, but I mean, there's usually some things that we can help out with, and if we can't, we'll help find the right place where you can go. And then the other thing that's kind of nice with our department is that you know, we have a port, we have a manager in the department that uh, kind of knows all the different um, um, organizations out there that might be able to help. So there's kind of both state and kind of local regional organizations that sometimes provide assistance and have um, information or have um, assistance available to help businesses or you know smaller individuals do things. Okay. Okay. Good. If you so, um, does anyone have questions for Kyle? Yeah, Kyle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, this group, this group talks about, you know, we, as you know, so we talk about um, getting policies and practices more equitable and, you know, making sure the community is for everybody. So I'm just wondering, um, because you do so much, we, it's, it's hard to kind of, you know, figure out where. Um, but as you kind of think about this group and, um, you know, it could go a lot of different directions, but if you either had questions for this group or if there's something where you're thinking, um, I wish we were able to do this, or, you know, one thing we've kind of talked about in terms of business is getting more businesses that reflect, you know, the community or reaching out more to maybe small businesses or, um, you know, so that we have businesses that are, are here for everyone. I'm not saying this very well. But in thinking about what is under your purview, are there things that you feel like you're either looking at in the next few years or questions that you have for this group that would help maybe in some of the thinking that the department's doing. I want you to be able to use this group as much as we want to ask you questions, you know. Um, well, I know I'm talking about the nine-point loan program, but I don't know how that's going. So I'm just trying to think about if there are other things. Well, the, the, the question I would have is just what, should, what, do you think, what do you think we should be working on in Red Wing that maybe we don't have right now? Is there something that we're missing or some area where, you know, you're just you think that we should be spending more time focusing on? Mm -hmm. No, no, I, you remember the, the other person that um, last meeting was last meeting. We were thinking about the, the bridge uh, oh, up, in, up to the high school. Oh, yes, we were talking about, yeah, because the safety, um, mm -hmm. and they are hoping to get a grant to get this safety program, so mm -hmm. yes. So things like that, you know, we talked about for transportation, a lot of ideas, and Jeff had some ideas from everybody. And so we're, one, one idea that I think is still on the table is, I, but I don't want to say it if it's not, is a, um, an upcoming loan program for BIPOC women and veteran entrepreneurs or small business owners. So that's something in the near future or kind of out there on the horizon. It's, it's on our work plan to do, and the council yeah. did set aside some of the, um, it was the ARPA funds, wasn't it, mm -hmm. that we received, yeah. um, to create a newer program for supporting more local businesses, and, and I think with the, with the target of, like you said, the BIPOC businesses and business community. So we're still working through how you do that, how to best set that up so that that can you know have the most um, impact, uh, however it's being used. But I think the goal is to, is to really support and promote you know, our local community um, in terms of finding um, or having the ability to create and, 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 and uh, um, establish businesses in the community. And I, I know one of the, one of the complaints we, we sometimes get at, at the port is that, well, 
you know, a lot of our loans and a lot of our work is geared towards these big developers that come in and want to do bigger projects. And we don't offer a lot of assistance for somebody that's smaller that just wants to, you know, find a space to start a business and, and, and uh, try to get started. So I think we are trying to think through how do we do that in a way that, again, we're, we're offering some assistance to no situations where, um, you know, we can provide some assistance to um, help create something that otherwise wouldn't happen. Um, so I know we thought, well, maybe there's, maybe we need to, to have access to some space or make some space available, you know, that you know provides for opportunities again to establish your business without having to pay, you know, exorbitant rent rates um, at the start. Um, and that's the other thing we kind of keep hearing too is that as we, we've had some more properties being bought up and as the, kind of the economics right now are driving prices up for land and buildings. Uh, those rents are going higher and just making it harder for somebody to, to start out and actually afford uh, to start a business, rent space, and, and, and make, it, make it work. Um, so those are all things we're kind of looking at how to best, again, structure a program where we're providing the assistance where it's most needed and where it can have the biggest impact in, in the community. What do people think about that idea, having space open for, I guess it would have to depend. And that's kind of what Ignite does too. I mean, Ignite, part of what they, what their mission is they provide space, you know, that, um, uh, and I don't know, it, the, I think there is some arrangement for leasing space, but it's very reasonable or it's far lower than what you'd have located somewhere else in the community. So that space is on the side of this building. And so there are folks that come in here and, you know, do anything from, you know, rent space a couple times a week so they can have a place to meet and, and have equipment and office supplies, those sorts of things. Uh, to having you know, more permanent uh, individuals in here that are, are in on a regular basis. So, I mean, that's another avenue, I guess, if you're looking at starting a business in the community where, you know, if, if, if you have and it works, you know, for what they offer, that um, they can hopefully get people into that next, next step, next year. Does anyone have any questions on the rental license program? And if we have renters, if we have landlords? Have you, or, or, or things you've heard, or things that you would want. So what do you do if the landlords, because we used it, and the landlords just ignored it. So then, like, then what happens? You mean, well, when you say you used it, do you mean well, a complaint? The, yeah. The, and so they, then an inspector came and... Yes, yeah, so an inspector comes and says, these things need to be changed, and the landlord's like, mm -hmm. <laughs> then, then what happens? There's, supposed to, there's enforcement that's supposed to be happening. How long ago did, uh, roughly, roughly, are we talking like six months? They sold the building. They were like, mm-mm, and sold the building. Ah. Well, and it's whoever's buying the building has to follow the, the guidance of the program. And the, the whole purpose there was that we wanted to have um, some system or some way that we could actually try to really get at some of the issues we're having with landlords not maintaining property or not doing these basic life and safety issues. So. In that case, they would not would not get a license, and if they don't have a license, they should not be renting. Um, so they're they we're kind of and yeah. So we're kind of working through that right now. What that looks like when we have that situation. Um, so it, it could, like Michelle said, it could be fines. Um, you know, it might be those fees and, and fines go on your property taxes um, and go against the property. Um, but it's it's a balancing act here because I, I think we're we're trying to we don't want to. You know, create a situation where renters are getting priced out of their their apartment because their because the landlord has to do improvements. But on the other hand, we don't want to have people living in, in locations where it's not safe to, to do so. So it, it's it's kind of hard, and because this is a relatively new program for us, we're still kind of working through some of the the growing pains of you know how you actually do this and, and uh, uh, make it work and, and bring them up to clients. So have you, yeah, either with people that you're working with or, I, mean, I don't know, we've talked about the rental license program a little bit. Have you been hearing from folks about it, good, bad, otherwise? I mean, just in general, not naming yeah. places or names or anything, but is there any I feedback just, uh, that you have? You know, uh, about the, you know, the mobile houses mm -hmm. more than that. How do you, or you don't, because they rent the, I mean, the land. That's right. Yeah. That's really a so that's still the main yeah a, a big yeah. concern yeah is the mobile and you know for we've example, had that on our list but they we have to get that oh, oh no no they are fixing the I mean the the street and the building with 
you know. Mm -hmm. And somebody asked me after the, I mean, if they are, you know, fixing the parking lot of the, because uh, some of them, they are in really bad shape. So I said, I you know, I'm not sure about that. So they need to ask, I suppose, because they, they I mean, they rent the, the land, I suppose, so I think that they must to repair the driveway, I mean, the parking space. But yeah. I don't know if that, if that works that way. So. I think we check that out in Aspen, right? Aspen runs right through, and that's the only one that the city owns. So like parking and the driveways, all of that. I'm looking at Kyle to see if I'm right about that. But we checked that, and I think a lot of that space is owned by the property manager or owner. Do you know what I mean? Okay. Which yeah. is not a good answer because... Well, we have, we have two mobile home parks in town. One is Pepin Woods. The other is Grandview. Yeah. And Grandview, I know that owner, is work looking at doing upgrades and bringing in new sewer and water and, up, up doing, and doing the roads. Um, but most of, most of the time those roads are private, so they're not under our control, so we don't regulate you know, what's happening within that, that area. Um, I think our code does have some standards for parking. Um, but most, the two mobile home parks that we have were there before our ordinance and regulations. So there's some, some things that got grandfathered in because of that. Okay. We've so. been saying this though, and I feel just terrible about it because, yeah, so we've been talking about mobile homes for um, about two years here, and then I know it was at least two years before that. And yeah. so we, you know, I'm going to put that on the list again. Just. You know, the, yeah. the idea of what do cities have control over and what don't they, but I think yep. there are different ordinances. We researched yeah. some stuff a while ago, and I think cities do have some wiggle room on how much. Um, oh, and maybe, right. Yeah, well, and, and also how much control they have, and mm -hmm. maybe um, it's tough. <laughs> I know, I know. I know. Because, you know, I was thinking of because, you know, they rent their land and if they rent the land, I suppose they have to fix the, the parking space, but you know, you said that, yeah. the, the owner yeah. wants to do it, so yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, and sometimes those, those are requirements, and so they should be keeping those up and maintaining those in a way that they can still be used. Um, but it's, it's hard because it, it's, we're not always, you know, looking for those issues and aren't aware of them until somebody brings it up to our attention that, hey, you know, this parking is gone or it's not being kept up. So mm -hmm. it's. It is a little more difficult because of that private ownership of the of the land underneath the mobile, the manufactured housing. Oh, but yeah, and, and some things are regulated by the county and the state, and so maybe we can find you know I, we could do some research on that because if some things are regulated by the county or something, and maybe nobody's I mean I don't know, but if there are regulations and somebody's not meeting those, then there has to be probably some. I don't know. So we could check on that. Um, when you say parking, just so we, just, uh, is it like the driveway? The individual driveway, parking yeah. spot? Okay, the, the driveway, okay. The, okay. Yeah, the okay. parking spot. Okay. Um, any quick questions on housing, um, affordable housing, I think? Kyle, can you just really briefly talk about the project with Three Rivers? Just, I mean, this group, I oh, think, yeah. knows about that, but maybe just two minutes or three minutes on that. Is everything okay? Okay. You looked, you looked not okay. So, okay? Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. so Three Rivers Community Action is a local group that supports housing and um, affordable housing, particularly in communities, and then they are working with our HRA. And they just come here a couple times, so they, okay. so they do. Yep. kind of familiar with what they do. Um, they also, they're on transit, don't they, in mm -hmm. town too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, they do several different things, but they're working with our Housing and Redevelopment Authority to identify and find a project to, um, you know, bring affordable housing into the community. So they have been, we've been kind of working with them to identify some potential sites, uh, we had a list of about six sites that uh, we think could work. What they would like to do is it's about, I want to say about a 40 unit building, mm -hmm. uh, which would be, I think, multifamily, but more of a townhouse type structure. Um, no more than two or, th or three stories. I can't remember the details of exactly what it would be. Um, but they have programs that they can apply for through the state um, to bring, you know, the price of, of those units down. Uh, so it's, it's basically it's an affordable housing tax credit program. 
uh, or they get some um, assistance or uh, funding uh, through the state with the intent of meeting certain objectives for income levels uh, for the uh, renters within these facilities. Um, so uh, we're I think working with them on that. We've identified a site that seems to that potentially work. It's owned by the city. The other benefit of that is that if the city were to uh, provide the land, give the land away, that helps them you know, achieve much more affordable um, targets um, for that property. Um, so we expect that's going to be discussed and moving forward sometime in the next year. I think they were looking at construction in 2024. Uh, so we're excited to have you know, that, um, that option, I guess, uh, moving forward here using them as, as a partner organization. And if anybody here wants to, um, Leah, who we've met, um, she is having a series of these, well, she's having a specific committee. I think Sarah's on that committee. And she would like to have other people in the community. So if you would like to have kind of a say, or if you know of anybody who really wants to have a say in affordable and supportive housing. So it is, you know, like 42 units, and a fourth of those are supportive so that they are... Um, people who are um, either going through a housing transition or um, getting over addiction, um, um, a number of different things like that, there will be um, a person on site at that facility um, who will be able to run programs and things like that. Um, and like Kyle said, it's, it's not just single, smaller homes. It's also two-bedroom, three-bedroom, and a couple four-bedroom. So it's meant for families, you know, so, um, and it'd be um, kind of up by, we think by possibly the site, and it's public because this yeah, committee is uh, talking uh, about it. Yeah. It's, um, you know, where Noyce and Dental is, it's kind of by Walmart, but before Walmart, there's a, um, the Blue Dog Veterinarian, or Animal Hospital place, mm -hmm. and then the Noyce and Dental, and then the daycare, thing. yeah, so it's right next to that, yep. Mm -hmm. So, um, that's the site that they're looking at, and please let me know if you want to be either on that committee or have a conversation with Leah specifically about that project because she wants, that. that's a big goal of hers is to reach out into the community to talk to lots of different people about that project and what they want to see there. So, or if you have a group of families who want to meet with Leah, she will meet with you. So, it's a, it's a really, it's probably the biggest affordable, supportive housing project that we've been talking about for a long yeah. time. So it's a big deal. And like I said, it will not get, um, if everything goes well, it still would just get built in 2024, but we would find out in less than a year if the city actually gets the big, huge, the big grant from the state. Yeah, housing is a big issue in our department just because there, I think there was a housing study done by Goodyear County a few years ago, and it really identified that we're, to meet the demand for housing, we're well short of meeting that requirement. I can't remember if it's a thousand additional units or whatever the number was, but it was a substantial number. And then they also look at affordability of those housing units, you know, based on what people can afford in the community and, um, you know, again, where the demand is for those types of units. And we're kind of short across the board, across all types of housing. Uh, so. I think part of the reason for that is, is um, you know, just with Red Wing, we're kind of constrained for land. Um, with, with the hills, lots of everything else around us, we just don't have a lot of wide open spaces that you can build and do it fairly cheaply. <laughs> so that's, that's been a challenge here. But then in addition to that, you know, we've seen some growth, but not enough really to keep pace with what's happening in other cities and other places around us. Um, so I, we kind of hear that off very repeatedly, that especially for people that own businesses or have larger or larger employees in the community is that they, they just they can't get workers because their workers aren't able to find places to live in town either that, that's affordable for them or that are places where they would like like to live um, so i think that's one of the things we're really trying to tackle and trying to work on like with the three rivers project and just by trying to help you know promote um, more housing development in general whether it's market rate apartments more single family homes and, and so forth so it's something we're, we're working on, we're aware of, and we hear quite a bit from, from people in the community. And, and I know whenever you talk about affordable housing, it, it tends to, to, uh, to have a certain connotation or whatever. Um, but I think the more I've been involved in these projects and worked on, on things in, in the past, um, really it's just about providing housing for all members of your community um, and across all spectrums. And 
Uh, like I said, it could be um, somebody new coming in to start working at the shoe company. It could be somebody that's working at Kaplan's. Uh, whatever, you know, it's just we need more housing. So I think we're very much aware of that and, and have that in mind as we think about uh, some of our goals for, for our department um, in the next few years. Uh, the HRA has been a very good partner. I don't know if they'll go come in and talk to the advisory team. Well, these guys, not, have, these guys have done a ton of housing yeah, stuff. So They've got HRA housing. Sure you're talking to them, yeah. Lots of people, kind of all at once. We had a couple kind of workshoppy type of things. So, yeah. So maybe um, just to kind of talk about some things we do in our department and just to get some perspective from you guys. Um, are you familiar with the old uh, St. John's Hospital site off of 4th Street? Um, so that, you know, the hospital was torn down. 4th Street, um, um, Street. So if you're like downtown, going to Buchanan's. Oh, yeah. And there's that, have you been up there lately? It's all flat. Yep, yeah, it was a hospital and then the hospital was torn down last year. And so it's all vacant. Um, I, I, I think I can say this now because there's been some work towards this, but there's a developer that has actually made an offer on the property and is going to be talking and having a neighborhood meeting coming up here in a week and a half, I think, uh, to talk about that site. Um, so I know there's been a lot of um, pushback about having higher density on that property. Um, I don't know if you guys want to share your thoughts on it or if you have any comments about it, but. Um, it's a good time to be talking about it because, um, you know, as we've had people ask us about that property, one of the things we really encourage them to do is talk to the neighborhood before doing a lot of work, putting plans together, and then presenting it. Um, you know, as, if they own the property, they don't necessarily have to listen to that input, but um, we know there's going to be a lot of interest in that site. So you'll be hearing about our department, in the, I'm sure, in the paper and other places soon enough because <laughs> we'll be involved in reviewing that. Um, but what's interesting on that site is that it's, it's guided you know, in our comp plan for more of a mixed use project with the idea of having some higher density there, whether it's an apartment building or something else. Um, the property was never rezoned though to support that. So the zoning still is um, really what the rest of the neighborhood is, which is it's technically an R2 zoning district, but it would be anywhere from four to eight units per acre, which would really be nothing more dense than maybe some townhomes. So that's going to be a decision the city needs to make on that property about well, what, what we actually, you know, as a city, approve for the property, what we want to see and everything. And I guarantee there's going to be a lot of neighborhood uh, feedback. So I don't know if you guys have thoughts or just in general what you think about that, um, what you'd like to see there. You got three minutes. You might as well give Kyle what you think. <laughs> I was hoping that the old hospital would have been redeveloped because, you know, places I like to live or you know visit when I go to friends in Minneapolis it's always those old brick buildings um, they just have a great feel mm -hmm. um, so I like personally I like the density because it's just there's a different energy um, and it's a, a more a tighter knit community I think and uh, um, just the, the places that I'm drawn to as a more creative person or whatever I think you like to live in those you know interesting buildings um, so, you know, to me, density is a positive thing, um, but, you know, I don't live there, so. Yeah. We'll do a quick around the table. What do you guys think? Sarah, what do you think? I think that if there was a study done that we are missing a thousand units of housing, mm -hmm. and you have 38 units going in here, and 44 here, and 12 here, it's a long ways from a thousand. And that if we know that that's in need of the community, then why are we listening to 5, 10, 25 people who live in the neighborhood versus the thousands of people who need a place to be housed? Yes. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I've been myself personally looking for housing for months, two, two three months. And I find, found something, a two bedroom for me and my two kids, but Finally found something, hopefully, mm -hmm. very hard yeah. right now. So, and like the people that we're renting from are selling our house, so we have to get out of there. And so it's like, it's been a really tough, tough time trying to find something. But I'm like, what do you wear? We're going to shoot. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, my life's down here, everything's down here. So, but it's just been really tough, so I agree. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, no. I mean, 
I've been living in Germany a couple of years, but that this is, you know, the first time that I hear, you know, of the commission, so I just get knowledge about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are we talking about specific location? Is that the question? Yeah. Um, I'm just, I've, I've got some that lives up in that area, and they just bought within the last year. Yeah. So they're getting to know their neighbors and stuff, and of course this came up, yeah. you know, after it was tore down, and they're talking about, you know, apartment buildings and stuff like that, but, and um, being somewhat an older, they're probably the youngest couple there, and, uh, you know, an older area, you know, they're like, you know, we had residential housing here, and then that was the hospital, which, you know, it's completely different than having apartment buildings there. So it's like we bought a house here. We don't want an airport built next to our house. They look at it like that. We want to keep it residential. They'd rather have somebody come in and put in whether it's affordable housing or, but more like single family homes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what mm -hmm. they've done it about. Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I don't know if a developer that just isn't enough money for them to do that or what. Yeah, no, my, my wife has some friends up in that neighborhood and they let her know they will not accept multi-family housing up there. Yeah, I think they know what I do, so <laughs> I'm not going to name any names. <laughs> so. I, can I ask a follow-up question with what you just yeah. said? So you, you made the statement, and I think it was a joke of, I'm not going to let that happen here. And does that, if a private owner bought that land, can the neighbor shut it down? Technically, no. Um, neighborhood opposition is not enough reason for the city to deny a project. It has, there has to be some other reason for rejecting a proposal. The reality is, though, when you have an entire neighborhood and 100 people show up against a project, it, it makes it really tough for the council to support that project. Uh, you know, good, bad, or different. You know, it's just, that's just kind of the way it works. Um, the other challenge we have with that site is because Mayo spent as much money as they did tearing that building down. They have a lot invested in that site, and they, they're selling that at a loss. I mean, they're not making money selling the land. Uh, but I think their intent was to try, to try to get it out from under, they just don't want to maintain that land anymore. They want to not have, not be an owner of land. Um, but their asking price was more than what really would support a single family development. Because um, you can imagine the cost to build a home now, by the time you factor in that land cost, you know, we had kind of played around that a little bit and decided that, you know, even the best case scenario, I mean, your single family homes and that, that, that scenario would have to sell for five or six hundred thousand dollars. I mean, just to make it work, you know, for a developer to come in and put in the, do the infrastructure and, you know, make all the improvements to the property and everything else. Um, and they probably couldn't build them for less than that. And that's one of the big challenges we have right now in, in building housing and making it affordable is just the construction costs are so high. Even if somebody wanted to try to build, you know, units that were a little more affordable, it, it's really tough to do with the way the land prices are and then those construction costs. And then to, to be clear, Kyle, am I understanding it correctly that let's say that that area was zoned for, um, he knows all the numbers, but you know, it's R2 now, and it, let's say that it was zoned for apartments. Let's say there's another space somewhere that is zoned for apartments. Does the developer then even have to come to the city, or can they just buy land, do what they want? So if this had been zoned differently, mm -hmm. nobody would have to come to the city. The reason why they're coming to the city, right, is that they need to ask for the zoning to be changed to what That's the exactly density. Right. Yes. Okay. So the comp plan says it should have density, but the zoning does not match that. So I just wanted people to know that you don't always have to get city yes. permission, you know, to do something. Yeah. It's they have to change the zoning. Okay. So I'm just wondering if um, is there any data on the there's the huge apartment complex on Featherstone, like a block from there or whatever, a block from Jefferson. Has that been a huge like issue for the neighborhood? Is it creating a lot of issues or not? Because I mean, it won't be any bigger than what's half a block away. I mean, I don't know, but no, maybe there have been, maybe there, maybe there are crime reports or studies that show that that area's been 
this high blight area. Um, I, I don't want to say because I don't, I don't have any drivers. Yeah. You know, before it and show that. It was nice to have like, like there's some just facts. That, yeah. you, know, say, you know, this is one that's in the same neighborhood, a block and a half, the other side of Jefferson School. So basically the same distance. And it hasn't created problems, or maybe it has, I don't know. But um, having, having some data to, to at least just come back and say, I know it's scary, but here we've got a you know a living example that's been you know in your neighborhood for you know fifty years and it's had zero issues or whatever. Because it is scary, it can change it's always scary. <laughs> you know, the unknown is like no one likes that. But if, if you start to look at just what is there, it's like okay. You know, yeah, well, we really, in this case, when we talked to this developer, we said, bring examples in so people can see what, what have you done, what does it look like, you know, maybe give a chance for people to walk and actually see projects that you've done um, to get a sense for what, what you'd be doing here. Um, and no no two sites are the same, and there's always going to be some differences, you know, with it, but um, I don't know, we'll see. So just to make a plug, if you're interested in seeing what's happening and what's going on, that meeting actually has been scheduled for um, September 28th, starting at 6 p.m. at the library. This is built as a neighborhood meeting for that, that project. Uh, the developer sending out a letter to all the neighbors within 600 feet of that property, um, basically inviting them to this neighborhood meeting. So September 28th. September 28th. That's a Wednesday, right? Okay. I think. Yeah. How many houses are 600 feet? Like, is that like the next three houses or the next five houses? Yeah. It's quite a few. 600 feet is about two blocks. Really? From that site, so it's a good number of houses. I'm guessing a couple hundred houses okay. at least would have been notified. Yeah. Good job, you hear about it. My grandma lives up over there, so she'll probably be there. I said my wife will be here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> well, good. So everyone is invited to that. Wednesday, yeah. so, did you have a time? Oh, 6 p.m. 6 p.m. starting in library. Wednesday, yes. And this, September is, this 20th is a meeting the that the developer is doing, so I want to make that clear. Like yeah. Sometimes people get confused about, is this a city meeting, is the city sponsoring? We're not. It's the developer reaching out to the neighbors. Uh, now, we'll be there because we want to hear what's going on and ask your questions and so forth, but um, I don't know. We'll see how this goes. I mean, the intent is that he's getting out in front of people early in the process before there's been a lot of decisions made. Um, hopefully he has some good ideas, and we'll see. Um, me personally, I think from what I've heard, um, you know, I, I am going to try to encourage them to do something that provides some public space there, open space. Um, I like the concept of maybe doing like a splash pad or something with a small playground. Um, so that's going to be my kind of pitch to the developer is, hey, you know, let's try to create some public space that can be used by everybody in the neighborhood, benefit the neighborhood. Um, but. Yeah, because the only park by there is the one behind the, the school or yeah. school or whatever. Um, and it's not very big. It's kind of boring because yeah. my, my son is very tired of going there. Yeah. <laughs> so that would be a bit of a splash pad. Yeah. A splash pad, yeah. Well, do you, guys, do you guys use, have kids that use a splash pad that's in, in town at all? Yeah. Okay. I really like, you've been to Lake City, their marina area, and seen that one? I really like that one now. They have a little splash pad there. It's, it's pretty much all concrete, and you wouldn't know it's a splash pad until you push the little button and then water starts shooting up from everywhere. The one, I like, like the one at Lake Billsby is so cool. It has like a waterfall, so it has an upper and lower, and then you can like run up and down the waterfall. Cool. I was really impressed by the one in Lake City, so I'm going to point cool. that out to the developer. Too, yeah. Um, he might not build it, but I think he might do something there. You know? Remember in Minnesota, I use it to build it. Right, for sure. But I live near the splash pad, and yeah, it like is her. used all the time. You like the all of the time. Like her, so yeah. <laughs> 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 it's it's a much fun. Fun. <laughs> I love it, but. Okay, guys. Well, thank you. It was officially two hours later, so we will. Adjourn. We don't even really adjourn, but we'll adjourn this meeting.